The organizers came up with the idea of celebrating the 20th meeting of the RNA Society by asking some of its early leaders and founders, and in fact, the first seven presidents of the society, to discuss their own perspectives on the RNA community and the society and what it's been like to do research in the field. And that idea, I gather, grew out of post-meeting questionnaires in the past where people had asked to see more and hear more from these kinds of folks. Still, it's a really weird feeling, at least to me, and I'm sure for everybody who's up here, <laughs> to be doing this. Um, you know, the society has always been really egalitarian, and its heartbeat has been the grad students and postdocs and young faculty. And you're out there, and we're up here. So one thing I really hope will happen in this session is that you will participate. Um, all these speakers have been asked to give um, six-minute talks, and then we have four minutes of questions. None of the six, or apparently I must have said seven once. <laughs> None of these people have given a talk six minutes long in a gazillion years. So we'll have to see how that works out. I'll do something when six minutes have passed. Okay, so now um, I decided I would introduce everyone all at once rather than spend time for each person. So these folks, the panel, uh, share three salient features. The first is, of course, they've all made great contributions to RNA research. Some have studied uh, you know, one problem, broadly speaking, for all of their career. Others have been more dilettantish, and others have even left the RNA community. But um, all have really made substantial contributions. They're all also really decorated and distinguished out the wazoo. They've won awards, gotten medals, are members of illustrious societies. Um, there's even a commander of the British Empire. There's Everything you could ask for up here, we know, we all know they're great, and that's all I'm going to say about it. And then finally, the third characteristic is that they, and in this one case I have to include myself, we're all, shall I say, mature. <laughs> I calculate there's about 350 years of experience in the RNA field up here. <laughs> So hopefully the perspective that comes from 350 years won't be too blurry, but will actually be informative and fun. The speakers are going more or less in the order we have here from this side to the other side. Um, and the charge that they were given was extremely broad, basically to do whatever they wanted to, to talk about the history of this community one way or another. And they're going to do it in quite different ways, I think. So we're going to start with uh, Joan Stites, who was a founder of the RNA Society and its first president back in 1995. Joan? I'm going to be totally autobiographical. And what I want to tell you about is what it was like before it all began, when I first got into it. Um, and what you will clearly see is how immensely things have changed. And when I think back on this, I feel that it's been a real privilege for me to have been a part of the 20th century revolution in biology. So in 1953, when the structure of DNA was proposed, I was in junior high school. And by the time I got to college, it was still too new to have made its way into either textbooks or even into courses. The way I learned about the double-stranded structure of DNA was I went to Antioch College and had a work-study program, and I ended up in a very privileged job at MIT with Alex Rich. And that was where I first heard about this. Now, just to make sure everybody knows who Alex Rich is, 
Uh, early on, he had worked on RNA triple helices. He subsequently saw the structure of D Z DNA, uh, the structure of tRNA. Uh, and what I did in that lab, I was a technician working for a graduate student and a postdoc, John Warner and Paul Knopf, was people had, um, we knew, of course, at that time that you could take DNA, heat it up, melt it, and then cool it down, and the strands would come back together. People knew that ribosomes had RNA. People thought you might be able to do the same thing with ribosomes. So I spent three or four months standing in front of a DU Beck Speckman, Beckman <coughs> spectrophotometer, heating up ribosomes, watching the optical density rise, and then cooling it back down and hoping that the optical density would go down, which of course it never, ever, ever did <laughs> uh, under all those buffer conditions. But I got hooked. Uh, nonetheless, I decided after that that I better go to medical school. And the reason was I'd worked in several labs, I'd looked around, I'd never seen a woman head of lab or a woman professor in science. I did know some women physicians. That only changed for me the summer before I was about to go to Harvard Medical School. I ended up in the lab of Joe Gall, who was then at the University of Minnesota. Joe Gall is a very famous cell biologist who did most of it, has done most of his career at Yale and at the Carnegie Institute in Baltimore. Uh, he, again, uh, he invented in situ hybridization. He was the first to observe the octahedral nature of the nuclear pore complex. Um, for the first time, Joe gave me my own project. And by August 1st, I was so exhilarated, I decided that my future prospects didn't matter. I wanted to do science, I didn't want to do medicine, and I was able to switch to the grad graduate program at Harvard. So the field of molecular biology that I then entered as a graduate student in Jim Watson's lab at Harvard was small and very eclectic was new, so the people in it had come from physics or chemistry or virology, not from molecular biology because it didn't exist. Uh, I think there were maybe two dozen labs in the entire world. They were in constant communication with each other. I remember there was something called the IEG, the Information Exchange Group, that sent around preprints by snail mail, of course, to all the other labs so that everybody could keep up with the latest advances. And um, Things going on in the lab at that time, there was interest in the structure of ribosomes, uh, FMET as an initiator of protein synthesis, the identification of tRNAs as suppressors of um, nonsense codons. I remember the year after my first year in graduate school, I went to the um, International Congress of Biochemistry in New York, and word went around that Phil Leader was going to have something very exciting to say about the code, which at that point was not yet solved. And I remember crowding into the back, standing in the back of the ballroom Americana, and Phil Leader talked about the triplet binding assay, and that more or less filled in all the holes in the code. Um, what molecular biologists were united in at that time was feeling that you needed we needed to understand the molecular basis of life. And of course, if you're going to learn anything, you had to start simple. So everybody worked on bacteriophage and bacteria. I remember that people who were trying to work on mammalian cells were even derided for taking on something that was so complicated it would never be understood. So if you think about that and then fast forward, it was unimaginable that we would ever know the sequence of the four billion base pairs of the human genome. In fact, a co-graduate student of mine in the Watson lab wrote his entire thesis on the sequence of one nucleotide in a genome, what was at the five prime end of the R17 phage RNA PPPGP. That was his thesis. We had to start somewhere. Um, I never imagined that this whole revolution would have the impact it's had on medicine um, or that there'd be a multi-billion dollar biotech industry or that it would even impact forensics. And I, of course, never thought that women would have leadership roles in science or in academia. And I'll get back to that in a little bit if I haven't run out of time. Uh, so back to me, after I finished my graduate work, <laughs> I um, went to the MRC lab in Cambridge, England, 
because of its excellence in X-ray crystallography, which was not my field, but my husband's field. And when I got there, I had a little talk with Francis Crick, who said, oh, we're very tight in the lab. I'm not sure there's space for you. Maybe you can do a theoretical project in the library. <laughs> now, I, I, I knew that uh, theory was not my forte. So I basically went around hat in hand, sort of looking for a little bit of bench space and somebody who would give me a little bit of bench space. And I ended up with a project that had been sort of floating around the lab. People like John and Jim can attest to this, um, which was a very challenging project. And none of the male postdocs had dared take it on uh, because they knew that they probably wouldn't have results in two years to go back to the States to get a job. But I never thought I would ever have a faculty position. So why shouldn't I do this challenging project? And the project, of course, was to bind ribosomes to P32 labeled phage messenger RNA to with ribonuclease, get the pieces and try to sequence them using Fred Sanger's new sequencing technology. Um, and, you know, so this was sort of ribosome profiling at the single molecule level. <laughs> uh, for the first year, it was tough. I got virtually nowhere. I almost gave up on the project. Uh, but then I figured out a new strategy, and I remember having a talk with Sidney Brenner, who said, oh yes, difficult experiments are sort of like bad marriages. You have to give them one last try before you get them entirely. <laughs> and that one try worked, um, and all of a sudden I found myself being offered jobs faculty jobs back in the U.S. at the same places that were offering jobs to my husband, which was unbelievable. Uh, so that's more or less where I'm going to end. I just want to say what had happened in the three years we were in Cambridge was the women's movement in the U.S. and also gathering momentum was the idea that universities should be hiring women on their faculty. And there was, in fact, a guy named George Schultz, who was the Secretary of Labor under Nixon. And he went back to the Equal Opportunities provision of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and actually wrote letters to universities and said, you have to have plans for hiring women or you might lose your federal grants. And nobody lost a grant. But if you look at a plot, there was a big upsurge in the number of women, particularly on science faculties in the early 1970s. And I think one other person on this panel may in fact owe her job to that very letter. So I'll quit there. So that's the prehistory. <laughs> So any comments or questions for Joan? Actually, what you said, Marv, was we were supposed to say, you know, what, what, what we had to say, how it would relate to questions that the audience might have, like what about their futures? So I think you've gotten the idea that things were very different, both in terms of what one was capable of doing and who was doing it in molecular biology when I started. And I think the same thing's the case now. It's going to be unimaginable what's going to happen, and it's very, very exciting to think about the future. So nobody asked it, but I answered it. <laughs> yeah, well done. OK, next up is uh, John Abelson. OK, so I'll just add one thing about this entire panel, and that is that they are like wine, and you can see that in the picture. There's hardly any pictures in which we don't have a glass of wine instead of an eye pulling in our hands. And I'm, I'm going to talk more, of, not about my history, and, 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 but about the, the, what we were trying to do when we formed the society. Most people would put the beginning of the uh, RNA processing field to a meeting that was uh, had at Brookhaven in 1974. And many of the people that are on this panel were at that meeting, but it was, the total wasn't more than about 30 people. And so there's roughly 20 years since uh, 1974 to the, uh, uh, to the period when we formed the RNA Society. So that's how long it took us to think that we should, should do that. And what I remember is that we had, there were, there were two main things that we wanted to do. Uh, 
who wanted to form a uh, society journal, and there's a really several really important reasons for this. First of all, uh, uh, everybody uh, who does science needs to publish papers, and they need to publish papers in very uh, well-regarded journals, and, uh, and uh, it's still the case, I think, that the, the top journals are not really uh, journals in science, they're magazines. So, uh, they, they're, somebody there is deciding what's trendy and what the pathway of science is, is, is what's difficult often and, uh, and it doesn't necessarily end up in science or nature. And so we formed the RNA Journal and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tim Nielsen has been the editor of this for the full 20 years and I, I, he's doing really <laughs> I also thought that we should own the journal. The, uh, the ASBMD owns the Journal of Bio Biological Chemistry, and about the same time the protein uh, people were forming the Protein Society and formed the Protein Journal. And so uh, I, I, both of them owned their journals. I thought it was really important for us to own our journal. Uh, and. Uh, Probably Nick, Tim could tell you about why that is. You can certainly imagine it. Uh, uh, when, uh, if Wiley wants to go their way with your journal, there's nothing you can do with it about it. But we own our journal. <coughs> okay, so uh, also the JVC made a lot of money on their journal, but I'm not sure. <laughs> so so uh, uh, then there's the meetings, okay? So we had been, ha been having RNA processing meetings, uh, and they had gotten bigger and bigger. Uh, uh, they were mainly at Cold Spring Harbor, and by this time, we really had outpaced Cold Spring Harbor, and first and second of all, we ne didn't necessarily want to do what Cold Spring Harbor had in mind for our meetings. So uh, the meetings have been a huge success, and, and, and the, the reason for this is the, 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 a policy that was never written down, and that is that the talks are by and large given by students, and but the professors are also but the uh, John Stites of the uh, you know, um, uh, they're all sitting in 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 the front row, and so when you give your talk, well, this is a serious thing. In fact, it's so serious that in our lab, in the Guthrie lab, we had three talks here, and uh, they were all rehearsed at least three times. And I mean, so it's uh, it, this is taken seriously, and 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 it is serious because. This is your chance to show the rest of, of, of the community uh, uh, that you're a good scientist. And it's also an excellent chance for you to make this uh, set of relationships that we had with each other at the, our time in science with your, your group of people. Uh, so uh, it's, it, I, I think it has been a success. And I, I, well, I, I won't, I'm pretty sure I won't be around for the 40th anniversary, but uh, oh, it's a lot of you will be. Uh, uh, and uh, I, I say one last thing. You know, uh, I've been doing uh, geobiology, which is a new field of, uh, that uh, combines geology and biology. And they've sort of come to the conclusion uh, that they should have a society. So I said, oh, I know how to make a society. <laughs> <laughs> so, Very good. Thanks, John. Anybody want to address anything to John? <laughs> This does not bode well for the future of the yeah. RNA world. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Good. So Good. the Good. suggestion was just made that we'll all do our thing, and then there'll be questions and discussions. And comments. And, 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 yeah. yeah, and your own yeah. recollections yes. and thoughts. Okay. So why don't we go to Ian? Okay. So. As usual, I'm astonished by, by the organized nature of my colleagues. Um, 
So this, this will be, by comparison, rather free form. <laughs> what I, I thought I'd talk about is how I got into RNA research and what it was like. Um, I think Jean and I came in a bit later, so I started to work on, on RNA in about 1979, I guess. And uh, I came to it by a, by a very um, tortuous route. I had done a, a PhD in the UK um, on nitrogen metabolism in bacteria and neurospora. And then I went to work in a transcription lab. I was very interested in transcription. And uh, I worked in a transcription lab in, in Basel in Switzerland for two and a half years. And I discovered that my entire project had been built on fabricated data. And uh, so I had to think about what to do next. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, a new young professor had been hired in the biocenter of the university in Basel, Eddie de Robertis. And, uh, and he had given a couple of talks about the work that he'd been doing on tRNA <laughs> processing and tRNA maturation. And I was fascinated by what he, he was doing. And so I went over to see him uh, in his lab. He wasn't there. Um, and so I, I just I left a note on his desk saying, hello, my name is Ian Mata. I am a postdoc working in the Friedrich Mischer Institute, and I'm looking for another postdoc. And the next morning, he came in and he found the note and he, said, he asked his technician, you know, do you know where this came from? And I used to have very long hair at that time. My hair was about down to my waist. And, uh, and his technician said, oh yeah, there was some hippie who came in and <laughs> <laughs> wanted to talk to you. Um, but Eddie, uh, new people in the Friedrich Mischer Institute, and he called them up, and uh, he obviously got good recommendations, and so he offered me a job. And what he was working on, I think many of the people who really founded the RNA Society came either from tRNA or from ribosomes in some way or other, or from RNA phage. And, uh, but Eddie's, Eddie's um, approach to the field was different. He had worked on tRNA, but when he went to Basel, and this is, again, this is a true story, he, he had to give a practical to something like 50 first-year students. And there was an experiment that he had always wanted to do. He had worked with John Gurdon in the LMB on several things before lighting on tyranny. And one of them had been to label proteins in the cell, inject them into xenopozoocytes, either into the nucleus or into the cytoplasm, and then see where they went in bulk and in a few cases individually. And so he decided it would be a good idea to, to do the same experiment with RNA. So he had these students inject mega amounts of P32 GTP <laughs> into oocytes, isolate total RNA, re-inject it either into the nucleus or the cytoplasm, and then separate them and see where the RNAs ended up. And, you know, you couldn't see very many RNAs, but among them were the ribosomal RNAs, obviously, but they were too big to resolve on the gels. Um, you could see tRNAs, and you could see what turned out to be US RNAs. And the US RNAs went from the cytoplasm to the nucleus, and everything else stayed in the cytoplasm. And this resulted in a publication in Nature for the entire class. <laughs> and, and, and was the result that I 
came into the lab to follow up on. And so I, I started working. I, I was still interested in transcription. We, we had identified these actually largely on the basis of methods that would be considered questionable at best nowadays um, as US nRNAs. And, uh, and I started to work on those, and I started to try to clone US nRNA genes from Xenopus, which was the organism we worked on. So I was coming to RNA from a very different field. I was interested in transcription. I was interested in transport between the cytoplasm and the nucleus and vice versa. And I was working with xenoposoocytes. And it turned out it was a, fa a fantastic advantage to, to be in this place where nobody else was at the time. Jim was doing some related stuff on US and RNA genes. But, you know, working on xenoposoocytes, are you crazy? So it turned out you could do all sorts of experiments in, in that system, which you couldn't do anywhere else. In fact, it isn't since till the invention of RNAi that you can now do in, in somatic cultured cells the types of experiment that we could do in the 80s in, in xenoposoocytes. So this, this was a really, it was a great start. And then, um, after I'd been in Eddie's lab, I think for two years, he said, you should go to the RNA Society. And no, it wasn't the RNA Society meeting. It was RNA called process. the RNA Processing Meeting. And so I, I went, and, and this was, it was fabulous. Well, I, there was one Cold exception, which I'll, yeah, it was in Cold Spring Harbor in that year. It was, it, it was in Cold Spring Harbor the first time I went, and it was in Rome the year that Glycotacchini organized the, the second year I went. So the, the one exception was the splicing session, which was boring as hell. <laughs> <laughs> because it was, it, was the, <laughs> it was the year that, that in vitro splicing was discovered to work. And it was very difficult to make the, the transcripts. T7 RNA polymerase hadn't been commercialized. It was, a, you know, T7 had invented it, but nobody knew how to use it at that time. And the extracts, it was complicated to make the extracts. And so there were, I think there were five talks in a row. There was the Sharp Lab, there was the Maniatis Lab, it must have been the Stites Lab. No, no it was we about it. We never tried it. Walter Keller's lab. He, he had a different John's way of lab. making the John's transcript. Lab. John's lab. And they all had the same intron. <laughs> no, no, no. Different except John. John. Different. And they all had <laughs> and they all had the same three mutations. Because the G U A G were the only things that were conserved, and so everybody had mutated those, and so they all had, it was so, you know, and I remember in a different context once hearing Charles Weissman, who was one of the people who had worked in, on this, um, saying that it was, you know, meetings, scientific meetings were really a terrible thing, because you know, in the course of 10 minutes, you could go from being a pioneer to being a plagiarist. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that session had it in spades, I can tell you. <laughs> anyway, but, but the, real, the real pleasure of being there was that coming from the outside with different interests, people were really, really welcoming. I don't know what it's like for a, a starting postdoc or a starting PhD student to come to the RNA Society meetings now. But then, people were really interested, took you into the conversations, were absolutely happy to answer questions. It was a really welcoming community. And since I worked on, after I worked on RNA, I worked on nucleocytoplasmic transport for many years. And I also worked on mitosis, and as I told you, I worked on transcription. Those communities are incredibly different. They're, they're not welcoming to new people. They are closed, if you like. 
and, and they have a much stronger sense of orthodoxy about how things work, even though they have no clue how things work. <laughs> they know how things work. And the RNA community was always very open, very open to new ways. And I think, I, I was trying to think on, on the way to the session of one, there have been mistakes in RNA research like there are anywhere. But I can't think of one non-genuine mistake in the field. And that's very unusual. You know, look at, look at the publications on the reproducibility of, re, of cancer research. It, that, that didn't happen in this community. And it was part of those founders who set the community up, who set the standards of openness, who set the standards. It, was, it really was a great community to be part of. And although I've been part of other communities, I still feel this is sort of, these are my friends, this is my family. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here. And before I start crying, <laughs> I'll hand back to Marv. Jean Banks is up next. Thank you. I'm going to take a similar approach to Ian. I entered the RNA field about the same time, and I'll tell you how and why I started working on RNA splicing. I was very fortunate to be a postdoc in the mid-1970s in the lab of Ken and Noreen Murray. It was the beginning, very beginning of the recombinant DNA era. It was incredibly exciting. Very little was known about the differences in gene expression between eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Most of what was known was known from E. coli studies. Now you could clone any gene in E. coli and study it. But there were some, this was before introns were known, but there were some concerns that even if you could get an, a, a eukaryotic protein expressed in E. coli, it might not be functional because of lack of post-translational modifications. And so I decided to try to develop a eukaryotic cloning system. And I chose yeast, even though I'd never worked with yeast, because it was known to have a plasmid and I thought it might be possible to develop it as a cloning vector. So in collaboration with a postdoc called John Atkins, we cloned the two micron plasmid. Nothing was known except that it was nuclear. And we, we, we characterized it a little bit. And then I got an independent fellowship and I went on to clone yeast genes by complementation in E. coli. It turns out that some yeast genes actually are expressed and function in E. coli to complement oxytrophic markers. And that's why many yeast vectors have the LU2 gene, URA3, TRIP1, HIS3, because they work in E. coli. And then I was able to use these to try to transform <coughs> yeast, and because it worked extremely well, because these plasmids replicated up to high copy number. So I went off to the annual yeast conference in, in Rochester, upstate New York, very excited to present my results. And I flew on a new airline. It was uh, set up by an entrepreneur called Freddie Laker. It was called SkyTrain. And it was a new concept. You didn't book your, ticket in your, your seat in advance. You just bought a ticket and got on the plane. And you couldn't buy a ticket more than three days before you were flying. So I, I flew from London to New York, and I went to the meeting, and I went back to New York to buy my return ticket. And it had become so popular, there was a queue outside the ticket office. That they estimated three days long. People were camping on the pavement. And I didn't have enough money to pay for a regular flight home. So I was stuck in New York. And by this time, John Atkins was a postdoc at Cold Spring Harbor. So I called him and said, help. And so I was put up at Cold Spring Harbor for a few days. And I gave a seminar. And I told people that I was now looking for a new project because I knew nothing about yeast. I didn't know any yeast genetics, but I had this wonderful system. And I really wanted to find out whether it would be useful to use it to clone genes from other eukaryotes. This was in 1978, and introns had been discovered in 1977 in Cold Spring Harbor and MIT, and Cold Spring Harbor was buzzing with talk of split genes. But it wasn't known how widespread split genes were, and there were no known introns in yeast. There were only a few yeast genes cloned. So I decided my next project was going to be to find out whether yeast could splice. And so I was going to have to find a, a good, a well-characterized uh, mammalian gene with introns, and soon after I went home, by chance, Charles Weissman from Zurich came to give a seminar in London. He was working with the rabbit beta globin gene, which was well characterized, had two introns. So I went up to him after this, his seminar, and I introduced myself, and I said, I'd like to put the rabbit beta globin gene into yeast to see if it's transcribed and spliced. And he said, that's a great idea. At the time, they were trying to, see, they were trying to find out if the rabbit gene was expressed in mouse cells. Everybody was trying to do these heterologous experiments. So he then produced a dictating machine, and he dictated a message to his secretary to send me a plane ticket. He'd met me two minutes before this. 
And I said, no, wait, I'm, I'm about to go on holiday in two days. I'm going camping in France. He said, oh, we have to do this quickly. And um, he said, I want you to write an application to EMBO for a fellowship to come to my lab while you're on holiday. So this was, of course, long before laptops existed. So I sat in a tent in France handwriting a fellowship application. <laughs> I posted this, I have a record of this, I posted this on the 21st of July 1978. I have a letter from John Toos dated the 1st of August awarding me the fellowship. So that wouldn't happen nowadays. So, so I went to Zurich and, and I, just to cut a long story short, the rabbit beta globin gene was transcribed. Transcription started downstream from, a little bit downstream from where it would be in mammalian cells, transcribed through the first intron, terminated in the middle of the second intron and there was no splicing. Everything was wrong. But there was so much interest in this that it was published as an article in Nature. Um, <laughs> aberrant splicing of the chromosomal rabbit beta globin gene in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. I then tried a drosophila gene, a plant gene, SV40 T antigen, and nothing worked properly. I got some partial splicing sometimes. And then the yeast ACT1 gene was, was identified as having an intron, and then several ribosomal protein genes were found to have introns, and it became clear that as a conserved sequence, the seven base, um, now what we now call the branch point sequence, was important for splicing in yeast. And of course, this was absent for most higher eukaryotic introns. Now, in uh, 1983, um, Michael Rosbash's lab was studying the in, in vitro splicing and, and it wasn't in vitro, it had been vivo splicing at that time by primary extension analysis and they discovered that there was a cleavage site in this conserved sequence so they decided to call it an intron cleavage site and of course this was unknown to them a branch point which was blocking the progress of the reverse transcriptase but they thought this was a cleavage site and at that time the U1 snRNA had not been discovered in yeast so they proposed in a, in a paper in cell excuse me, that, uh, that yeast might not have a U1 snRNA and instead the consensus sequence in the intron paired with the 5' end of, of, of introns because it looked similar to the 5' end of the U1 RNA and then there was an endonucleotic cleavage at the 5' splice site and one at the conserved sequence to produce the intermediates of splicing. So the same year, Mary Edmonds discovered branch nucleotides in the higher molecular weight nuclear RNA in mammals and she found the adenosine with a 2 prime, 5 prime, and 3 prime, 5 prime phosphate ester bond. And she proposed that this might come from splicing intermediates. And so in 1984, uh, Michael Rospash's lab, Michael Green's lab, John Abelson's lab all published that lariats are intermediates in, in the splicing pathway. And, and as, a, as a take home lesson, um, Michael Rospash survived. So you can survive from publishing an innocent mistake um, in, in a big journal. And I'd like to just finish by saying that my career was completely unplanned. I, you couldn't have planned it. I took opportunities when they arose. I hadn't, hadn't worked with yeast when I developed a yeast transformation system. I'd never worked with RNA at all before I started working in splicing. And to the young people, I'd say, if you have a good idea, you see a good way to do it, obviously do your homework. But if you don't have the experience, just get the experience and go and do it. So thank you. <laughs> Aki Ulenbeck. Okay, so first of all, I'm, uh, I have some trepidation being up there because I'm kind of conscious of seeing all of you out there listening to us rather than doing science. <laughs> and so what I want is all of you to promise me that tonight, instead of drinking, <laughs> you will be thinking. <laughs> to make up for the time that you lost listening to our questionable utterances. So, uh, uh, look, I don't want, uh, I, I've written about uh, my view of what the history of, RNA, uh, of the RNA Society was. I talked uh, a few years ago about uh, my career. I, I only want to, uh, uh, mention one thing about about this society and and the formation that I don't think I've said before. Um, I got into this group uh, uh, from a slightly different direction, which was kind of biophysical chemistry, and uh, trying to understand how RNA folded. And uh, uh, when I became an assistant professor, I realized that I couldn't do that unless we knew how to make RNA, and so I had about a 15-year detour in my career uh, figuring out methods on how to 
how to make RNA. And, and uh, it turned out that, um, you know, when you do science, you have to have an audience. And uh, I was really a chemist, and, and it turned out that most chemists weren't interested in making RNA. I mean, very few were interested in making DNA, uh, but uh, RNA was considered impossible, and I was using enzymes. That was the trick. Um, so um, I, I, there were no meetings to go to. And uh, so finally, I think it was Joan uh, suggested to me uh, that I go to these RNA processing meetings. And so it certainly wasn't the first one. The group had already started and was meeting in Cold Spring Harbor. And so I went uh, uh, to this meeting and quite surprisingly was asked to talk because my, my research seemed totally irrelevant uh, uh, to what they were doing. And uh, I remember going there and there was a, uh, the, the setup was not really very different the way it is, smaller number of people, but graduate students giving five-minute, seven-minute, incomprehensible talks. <laughs> I mean, to me. They all seemed to understand each other. <laughs> but I was clueless. And, and one thing I was thinking about last night, so, you know, it hadn't really changed very much. You know, look at all these abstracts, and I'm sure most of you say, oh, bo boy, I don't know, hardly any of this stuff. How can I possibly be a member of this field? But it's always been like that for everybody, that, that there is so much out there that you get. So the thing I, that struck me, though, is essentially what Ian said, that uh, the field was so welcoming about what I was doing, even though to me, and I'm sure to them, it seemed at the time pretty irrelevant. But I finally said, ah, I have a user group. <laughs> Somebody who might read my papers. And, uh, so um, I think that was, so it was the discovery of the scientific family that to me was the wonderful part of joining this group, even though the family was doing stuff I was, they had no idea about. And so the most amazing thing was that, of course, inevitably as the years progressed, I did manage to learn some of this RNA biology. And, uh, and was very struck as I continued to struggle in my areas of chemistry and biophysical chemistry, the degree to which the biology expanded in those years, in the last two decades, from kind of every few years, there was some new RNA that did incredible things. Yeah, there were introns being spliced. There were small RNAs that had originally been run off the bottom of the gel that turned out to be very important. Now there are long RNAs that were Nobody had ever detected it before because there were too few, and they seemed to be important. And so it goes. And so uh, this ability of biology to drive a field with so many new things all the time has, you know, I always view with great wonder, and I'm so pleased that the group uh, has taken in uh, uh, chemists and more recently structural biologists and was so inclusive. And in fact, that inclusiveness was part of the driving force of having to leave Cold Spring Harbor because there were too many people who wanted to go to this meeting because everybody was being included. And uh, I see even now uh, the chemical biologists, synthetic biologists, there are chemical engineers in the audience, and they're all being invited to this meeting to try to put their particular kind of out there types of science in with all this kind of central driving force of the biology. And I, so I think that's the strength of this thing, this group, is that, that the inclusiveness. And I really hope that, you know, it, it continues that way. And I, I will certainly do everything I can to make sure that happens. Okay, so now we need Harry Miller's slides. Oh, okay. We get to turn around. And a clicker. Okay, uh, is this one? Okay. I'll, I'm going to take a bit of a different tack and, and use the uh, slides as a crutch. Um, I would. Uh, 
reiterate what I said the other night and, and second what Aki has just said, that it's a wonderful society and one of the great things about it, I agree, is that the inclusiveness and I, I've always felt when I'm at the RNA Society, I'm with my peeps. <laughs> so Marv asked me to say, what was it really like, Harry? Well, I arrived at UC Santa Cruz in 1968 as an assistant professor, and I was asked to teach five courses, serve on eight faculty committees, and chair five of them. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> so when, when I hear young people say, gee, you guys had it so easy. Uh, <laughs> Huh. Oh yeah, there it goes. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> Life without pipette man. Uh, no Eppendorf tubes. 20 millicurie P32 ribosome preps. Isolating your own restriction enzymes. Making your own gamma labeled ATP. Uh, washing your pipettes and glassware with chromic acid to get rid of the ribonuclease. Draw your own figures with rub-on letters. <laughs> Type your papers on something called a typewriter. <laughs> Plot your data on graph paper. Submit your manuscripts via U.S. mail. Uh, ribosome function was based on proteins back then. <laughs> and and wa walking 20 miles... <laughs> <laughs> On the bright side, there were no personal computers, no cell phones, no earbuds, no handheld electronic devices. Skirts were short, hair was long. <laughs> that's, that's for you, Tim. Uh, Chalk and blackboards instead of dried out whiteboard markers. Uh, we got much more done in group meeting. Uh, you could still find pencil and paper in the lab. Uh, experiments took precedence over careers. Grants were sometimes funded. <laughs> Manuscripts were sent out for review. Cell press did not exist. <laughs> So this is what we used instead of pipette men. We had what were called Carlsberg or Lang-Levy pipettes, micro pipettes, and they had a little constriction here. And, and you attached rubber tubing to these things, and you wore the rubber tubing around your neck as a badge of honor. It was like a, the, our stethoscope. Uh, and you, you sucked on those things, the millicurie of P32. <laughs> Uh, we used siliconized glass yeah. test tubes uh, instead of Eppendorf's. Uh, and we had hundreds of these in little uh, compartments in the drawer, and we had to wash them with uh, chromic acid after using them. So uh, we didn't have SPLCs. There were sometimes uh, messages from the chancellor telling us about substance abuse. <laughs> But on the other hand, EHNS was much, uh, much uh, less stringent. And uh, the hair was different. Uh, I had hair, for example. Thank you. Christine Guthrie. Okay, now for something a, a little bit different. That was great, Harry. Um, <clears throat> I, I wanted to contend that I think one major reason for the success of the RNA Society is that it was actually a really strong community before it was a society. It, it was a group of really like-minded folks <clears throat> who started out by sharing a love for the RNA world and that it soon broadened <coughs> from merely an intellectual concept 
to a community who love to laugh together and drink together and travel the world together and share our stories and our ideas. Could I have the first slide? Yes. So here was the RNA world uh, in my version. Uh, in this one, we're all sitting here in Rome, and I said, baby, we've got to meet Aki in Rome. Everyone in the RNA world will be there. <laughs> I think another important fact that led to our eventual success was that this community comprised uh, a disproportionate percent of females from the outset. Um, I think this was particularly important historically. When I started graduate school here in Madison 49 years ago, gulp, <laughs> there were no female faculty, nor doing, during my two uh, postdocs, one in Europe and one back here in Madison, also no female faculty. And when I joined the faculty at UCSF in 1973, there were no female faculty. What made it particularly hard for me was, although there were no graduate students there at the time, there were a large number of female postdocs, and they were all desperate for a female role model. I, of course, had never had a female role model. And this really, their, their demands on me uh, just were very difficult. Uh, I already had tremendous scientific insecurities. Uh, actually didn't ever want to be a faculty member. And um, their expectations of what I was supposed to provide for them in terms of uh, leadership just added to these terrible insecurities I already had and uh, the tremendous fear I had constantly was that I was going to be discovered as a fraud uh, and uh, immediately found out at any moment. Could I have the next slide? Next slide. <laughs> 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 Back. Back one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and that's really how it felt every day. Um, I desperately wanted to make it, however, once I'd gotten that far. But um, not long after I arrived there at UCSF, uh, I received from my chair uh, a very negative mid-career review. He was later shown to be an extremely misogynistic leader, nonetheless, uh, being delivered of this message that I was unlikely to make it, and uh, followed very shortly by the premature death uh, of a very treasured colleague uh, who had actually been my uh, first and only mentor. I fell into a very deep depression and that led to my hospitalization. But the remarkable thing about this was that it became very public knowledge, and uh, during the six-week course of, uh, of being hospitalized, many, many of my colleagues came to visit, uh, and this was, of course, mostly men, and they all said to a person, I know just how you feel. This is really a tough job. But none of them had ever expressed it. They felt they didn't have permission to express it. But now that this had happened uh, so in the open, uh, they really acknowledged that. And that transformed things for me and a lot of other people. And eventually, um, I think as a consequence of this, uh, we formed a group uh, which ended up being called GROUP with a capital G. Could I have the next slide? And uh, it was 
made up solely of peers. Uh, it was a problem solving as well as an emotional support group. And uh, I want to say that it was so successful that it's now been meeting every other Thursday for about 40 years. It, I want to say to all of you here that I think uh, the important lesson is that peer support is just uh, extremely important and um, I recommend it to you. Uh, it's based on forming contracts. Uh, originally, they were, of course, very um, career-oriented. I completely feel that if I had not been in this group, uh, I would never have gotten tenure at the time at UCSF. Uh, and so it provides those really important strategical functions but in addition, of course, now that we've gone on uh, almost four decades, uh, the group has evolved to deal with uh, uh, a different set of problems. Uh, professionally, it's how do we face retirement? What strategies should we use to affect that? What are our options? Uh, and at the same time, it's the personal issues, of course, have gotten quite different. We're now dealing with how do you age successfully and, and deal with the physical uh, aspects of that transition. So uh, ending and coming back to the significance of the society, uh, I want to echo especially what Ian and others have said. I think perhaps its greatest strength has come from uh, the original commitment of the founding members to champion a society that was collaborative and cooperative, a community that uh, has especially fostered non-hierarchical uh, relationships, again, that differs from many other communities that we could name and, and do. <laughs> um, and finally, that I think it has continued to try to encourage young members uh, and really I think uh, what our youngest members feel are important and supporting them that. And speaking of that, I think it's very brilliant that the young scientists here today have decided to end this event by sponsoring a junior scientist cocktail party. <laughs> It's a brilliant idea, and I'm grateful that we're invited. And <laughs> speaks well to the future of the society. Since I'm standing up to get this thing, I might as well give my little talk from standing up. Uh, Marv asked to, me to talk about what it was a long time ago. I mean, I think my, much of my talk is going to recapitulate what Harry talked about, and it confirms what Ian had said even earlier, which is the order of the speakers determines whether you're a plagiarist or a pioneer. <laughs> However, my, my slides were made before these guys spoke. <laughs> uh, we've, we've all heard a lot of the uh, personal reminiscences of, of various people here on, at, at the, on the stage. And I thought I would um, emphasize more sort of the general, what, what in my memory anyway, what life was like uh, early on yeah. in the RNA world before there was an RNA world um, in the, uh, the uh, early life kind of sense of it. I, I do want to say that I was ex I've always been very lucky in, in uh, both in the colleagues that I have and in the opportunities that have been given to me. Um, I've been an assistant professor since um, 1969. Uh, before that, I was uh, lucky enough to go to Cambridge, uh, worked with Fred Sanger for a couple of years, and then a year in Geneva. And uh, that really is, um, 
shaped my career. Um, <clears throat> in my, uh, early in uh, my career, that's from the late 60s, early 70s, for, uh, before half of this audience was born, I'm sure. Um, we had very simple ideas about RNA. There were, as Harry mentioned, there were, there were three classes of RNA, ribosomal, tRNA, and messenger, and that was it. Uh, there were no ribosomes, no aptamers, riboswitches, and so forth. And we had very limited tools to study uh, these RNA molecules. Uh, in terms of the uh, thoughts of what these RNAs did, ribosomal RNA uh, was not a catalyst. It was just a, a structure, a scaffold for proteins, is what our thoughts were at the time. Messenger RNAs contained only coding sequences, no uh, binding sites for proteins, and, if, and even if there were protein binding sites, what would those proteins be doing there anyway? Uh, splicing, of course, uh, was unknown uh, back in the early 70s, and, and in, in terms of transfer RNA, I remember a whole session at a Gordon conference, and this was the late 1960s, I think, uh, where there were real discussions of whether uh, transfer RNA was actually in the, the cloverleaf structure or not. Uh, so we were really working in the dark at that time. Uh, and transfer RNAs were thought to function only in translation. Now we know that, that a lot of other uh, functions uh, control uh, DNA synthesis primers and so forth. Um, <clears throat> we were aware that there were some other small RNAs, just because if one could isolate them and, and systematically uh, see that they were there, but we didn't know what the functions might be. Um, and in terms of anything smaller than about 40 nucleotides, tiny RNAs, they were just degradation products, and you just throw them off. Uh, in terms of methods to study uh, RNAs, uh, we had to isolate our RNAs from cells and viruses, and that, as uh, Harry alluded to, meant uh, working with 5 to 20 millicury preparations and hope that your flask didn't break, uh, which occasionally it did. Um, the purification of RNAs was often by sucrose gradients. Uh, certainly, we did not have polyacrylamide gels early on. Sequencing uh, was like doing a crossword puzzle, you would break, take an RNA molecule and break it in different uh, enzymes and try to uh, put the RNA back into uh, a single linear uh, sequence. So the structural methods were quite laborious. Um, doing sequence analysis, we had no computer, so you had to look hard at sequences and try to come up with uh, ideas about uh, what these sequences might mean. And there were few, if any, commercial kits and, or enzymes and certainly no kits. Uh, so we would have to make our own nucleo uh, ra radioactive nucleotides. Uh, Harry mentioned making alpha, uh, gamma labeled ATP. I, w I, had, I was doing a lot of experiments with alpha labeled uh, nucleotides, so we had, I had to learn how to make the alpha labeled nucleotides. And, um, which is several more steps than making the gamma. And uh, since they weren't commercially available, anybody who wanted to work with these things had to figure out how to do it. And, and as a result, Fred Sanger came to my lab, and which was a great honor at the time, that Fred would come to me for, uh, to be educated. And Fred came, spent a week in my lab learning how to make uh, alpha-labeled uh, nucleoside triphosphates. So in the good old days, what was life like? Well, you've already heard about diversity. And this, if, as I look back, I think there was very little uh, gender diversity and no racial diversity in, in the laboratories, or very little. It's uh, un, uh, unfortunate at that time, and I'm very pleased that it's starting to get it's better now. There, no internet. Communications were slower, but of course you didn't get spam mail and you didn't have to answer email. Nowadays, of course, if you don't answer an email within 
two hours or something, somebody thinks you're being rude to them. <laughs> Competition was less, both for jobs and funding. And I really think that I was uh, lucky to be in the right place at the right time. And I'll make no bones about that. We had a lot of excitement because it seemed like almost every time you turn around or read a new journal, uh, there was some new discovery that was a, a breakthrough importance. And of course we had uh, discoveries in our own lab and we would have lab parties. And with that, this is one I had in 1974. I had a very small group. And uh, you can notice that uh, there's something wrong with this picture. And that is, this was our uh, lab bench where we were keeping the, sh <laughs> the Triscuits and the Champagne. The group of friends that I made in, as a postdoc and a young professor, we've stayed very close friends ever since. Here's uh, John and, and Joan in 1972 who came to the lab. And uh, we've always uh, communicated and, and collaborated uh, in a uh, very open manner. We've also gone on trips together. Uh, this was the, uh, uh, our, our celebration for the millennium, uh, December 31st, 1999. We were in the Galapagos, and there's Tom Stites, John Abelson, Aki, me, Tom Check, Harry, and some creature who about a, an hour later ended up floating in the, behind the boat in, into the distance. It's some, something they like to do down there. So. Now, you'll notice that everybody in this picture is a male. Okay. It's not that we just had a, only males on this trip. We all had our spouses with us. And the, the thing is that all the women on the boat were too sober or too uh, intelligent to, to get into a compromising picture. <laughs> Finally, I, I want to say that not only having great friends that you stay in close con contact with every, uh, all the time, it's also a great opportunity to, to uh, have a, a supportive spouse. And I just want to say that Elspeth's been great. And this is us just after we were married in 1978 in a lab party, and this is uh, what she looks like now. And she hasn't changed much, except she's, she's now dyeing her hair gray. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to be the last speaker, and then we'll have comments. And I've been kind of turning over in my mind for the last few days what in heaven's name I was going to talk about, and I'm in a way even more confused now what I'm going to talk about. I certainly would echo the themes that you've heard repeatedly about the sense of community and the welcoming um, that this community has always had. Uh, contrary to what Ian said, I think I'm the guy who's the youngest in this community, not, not in terms of age, that I have no idea. But I've been in this community for only 33 years. And I remember that when I first went to the meeting, there was that sense of welcome and engagement and what you were thinking about and acceptance of ideas for ideas' sake. And that's always been a feature of the society. I, I think what I'll, I'll say just a few words about it's kind of a sense of the rhythm that I have felt in the RNA community over the years. So, and I, I say this because the younger ones among you, I think, well, it'll, this will be a hard thing to perceive. Um, but fields go through a period where the fields are elongating. You know, something has been uncovered, it's clear, you know, you find introns, you're blown away by that. But then it's clear you got to figure out how they work, do they change, and the field elongates for a while. And it's exciting elongation, but it's stable. And then all of a sudden, and this has happened so many times, as Aki alluded to, in the last 20 years, something happens that completely blows you away. Something you've been totally oblivious to. And I, I'm, I'll mention three such 
discoveries because there's a lesson in them. Um, so what are microRNAs? MicroRNAs were found by people doing genetic analysis of heterochronic mutants, mutants that mistimed cell divisions in C. elegans. They did their genetics, it led them to a 22 nucleotide RNA that turned out to regulate through the three prime UTR of a target, and then we all know what happened. Hundreds of microRNAs, thousands of targets, implications for disease, all of that. And it just blasted onto the stage. RNAi. The first hints of there being something interesting in RNAi came from sense strand control experiments where someone was trying to look at the partitioning of components in a C. elegans embryo. And then through some elegant biochemistry and genetics and developmental biology, it was determined that the active ingredient was double-stranded RNA. And then you got small hairpin RNAs, RNAi, inheritance, and so on. And finally, CRISPR. CRISPR looking for reasons why bacteria became resistant to phage. And I mean, I'm kind of speechless at how quickly that revolution has happened. But again, it came from open-eyed exploration of a problem that someone was interested in intrinsically. And so for me, those, those events have been, of course, they've been real thrills to be part of this community. Even though we have a we weren't the guys who found microRNAs or RNAi or CRISPR. It's just been a joy to be part of that. And the lessons, I think, to be learned from that are first, that it's good to be humble in going into these things. That nature is full of all kinds of things that we just have no idea exist. And you can't possibly know they exist until you stumble on them. And to be able to stumble on them, you have to be supported in pursuing your curiosity. And the converse is also true, that hubris and arrogance and the push to get away from basic curiosity-driven science, I think is really destructive. So I, I should stop myself. I don't really want to go on a polemic here, but um, it, it's tricky how to balance basic research that has been so inspiring against um, all the payoff that we all want to have from translational research. That's a tough equation. But you can't escape the conclusion from the last 20 years of these meetings that it's open-eyed exploration done with rigorous experiments that breaks things open opens new universes. There are great RNAs to find yet. Okay. So now, are there any comments? There's one in the front row. Are there other microphones? Thank you very much to all of you for sharing that. I think it's just great to hear it. And I think that uh, in any group, it's the shared stories around the campfire that really brings people together. So thank you for that again. I have a lot of different questions, but I'll focus on just two that I've kind of picked out randomly. And if you want, I can choose one person to ask each one, but I'll just say whichever. Uh, one is back to the comment about not having the kits, the pipettement, et etc. I would like you to comment on how you viewed that as those things became available. Were they looked on skeptically as just another big cost for the lab? Or were they kind of embraced and said, oh, this will make our um, experiments go much faster? Second question is about um, the rise in biotechnology and the um, RNA in biotechnology, in therapeutic applications, and how you viewed that as you saw it come up. Jim? Well, I'll, I'll start off by <clears throat> saying with the, the new technologies that were coming on, we all welcomed them with, I mean, it was great, because our hands were really tied oftentimes. Um, it did make for sort of different attitudes. Like, I, re I remember when uh, rapid sequencing came on, uh, on the scene, 
And Fred Sanger had been doing all these little, making little pieces and splicing them together and so forth. Uh, I asked Fred what he thought about it, and he said, well, it's, you know, it's very convenient, but it takes all the fun out of it. <laughs> <laughs> so what was the other? About biotechnology. Oh, biotech. I, th I think it's great. I mean, that... that As uh, a company owner. Yeah. Full disclosure, I started a company. <laughs> I no longer own it. But uh, I think it's wonderful that, that the discoveries that we're making are going to be, or are being incorporated into things that help the health and, and uh, well-being of the people who paid for them. So I see nothing wrong with that. I think it has to be in balance, but I think it's very good. I remember early on that, uh, early on, like 15, 20 years ago, when uh, there was a real squeeze in jobs, there still is, of course, but I was very thankful at the time that th there were job opportunities for my students or postdocs to go into that industry. And I just hope that sort of uh, opportunity continues, too. One in the aisle there. I would be really interested in hearing some of the students ask some questions of this panel. And so I would like you guys to be thinking about maybe some questions and maybe they could raise their hands, too. <laughs> Yeah, up on top. Number one. Students, sorry. Um, <laughs> but one thing I heard a number of you folks talk about was the atmosphere in the RNA community over the years, how welcoming it's been. Um, I think Christine used the word non-hierarchical. And what I think a lot about is, is how do we maintain that? You know, I think so far I've tried to be a good colleague because I figure Aki will kick my ass if I don't. But um, you know, 20 years from now when I've got a gray beard and some of the students here are PIs, how do we make sure that people are still saying that about the RNA community? How do we keep that up as it grows and the science gets more competitive and all of the rest? So, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there is, there's any simple way that you can maintain things, but there is the science that people do that is presented at these meetings and has been presented at these meetings over the last 30 years is nothing if not competitive. So I don't think competitiveness is, is a problem. People are competitive and that isn't only a bad thing. My impression having worked in, in actually at least four very distinct and separate fields, is that it's, it's really about the founder effect. Once you have a community that has a certain way of working as a community, that is something that you can maintain. And I don't think that you have to think up special formal ways to do this. I think you just have to keep behaving the same way that you have been doing over the last 25, 30 years. I don't think there needs to be somebody who polices this. And in fact, you can't police it. Um, but in other, you know, the field of nucleocytoplasmic transport that I spent a long time in was poisonous. It, w it was awful, awful, awful. And that was because there were one or two leading figures in that field who really didn't want to enter into competition with new people or enter into communication with new people about the field. And I, so I, I, I think it w it's chance that this community, I think what Christine said is absolutely correct. It was the first community that I had ever been part of that had senior female figures. And I think that was a, a major aspect of the founder effect of this field. But actually, it was, it's mainly chance. And I, but I don't think it's, it's in danger of going away, because that effect exists and the community exists. What is I'd like to say. Oh, yeah, John. Um, so this is just simple. So, so sitting here, uh, 
uh, I've known Joan and Jim for uh, more, almost 50 years, and uh, we were students together at, at, in, in Cambridge, and we kept that, that uh, relationship going. I would say I know, uh, I would say my best friends are almost never in my, live in my neighborhood. This, uh, this is my neighborhood. And so the, the, I would say to the students that the best thing you can do is to become friends with your peers, okay? I mean, uh, I mean have a sense of, of, of that you, you're, you're going to be taking over this thing, and, and it's not just the people that you know in your lab, it's the people that are uh, perhaps in, in, in Germany or in Japan, or, but you've gotten together and talking about ideas, and you form these relationships. And it's those networks of relationships going forward that I think maintain this. Yeah, let me just add something to that. The, this just add something to that. The slideshow that was going when you were all getting seated, which will be shown again between the sessions tomorrow afternoon and again at the banquet. <laughs> um, if you look at those pictures carefully, you'll see exactly what John is talking about. You'll see collections of people that clearly go way back. They're a lot younger looking. And they're from the times that they were, you know, postdocs together or young faculty together or whatever. And so I, I, that's real tangible evidence of exactly what John is talking about. Yeah, number two. Yeah, um, I originally had a similar question. I wanted to, um, as, as was just asked, but wanted to offer two other additional, uh, perhaps in, um, explanations here that you may discuss here. Um, and I mean, I had my sole own experience of being welcome to the field as a relative newcomer and uh, told my students a lot about this, so I thought a lot about this. And one of the things that the founders of this field, many of which who sit here at the table, and there are some others as well, have really done, is not only to uh, show this camaraderie and collegiality, but also to impart it on their students. So all of you collectively, have uh, probably uh, educated half of the second next level of leadership in the field, which then uh, educated another and trained another set and so forth. So it has permeated through, I mean, your ex um, model, uh, being models, but also to Im by imparting it on your students who then imparted that uh, attitude to the next level of students. And so I think that was, uh, that is something that we all can actually contribute and continue to contribute to by, by reminding our students that this is what the field is about and I agree totally that it's very different from any other fields for that reason. Another thing that you actually very ingeniously have done is to actually run this RNA Society meeting as the central meeting ha um, by, as basically a big group meeting. Right? So it's not the big shot. I mean, some big shots give some talks, okay? But, but, um, but many of the talks are given by students, right? Which then puts you, for example, or me, who sees my student presenting or so, in a position where I want to uh, cheer them on. I want to support them to be successful in the presentation. Unlike when, I mean, a big shot or an established person stands in front and wants to showcase what they're doing, right? So it's, it puts a very different feeling to the meeting which then also helps. So maybe you can reflect a little bit on, on these two key things that you did from very early days that actually helped. I think that, I think the principle of having grad students and postdocs do the speaking has really been an absolutely critical feature of the meeting. And I remember it actually being quite controversial and a lot of discussion whether to have plenary talks the first night. Because that was a deviation from that pattern. So I, I, I mean, I certainly think that's very valuable. John? So I, I give Jim Watson a lot of credit for this because when he took over as director of Cold Spring Harbor, he basically was in control, puppets, strings, um, of how all the meetings ran. And that was his model for how to run all the meetings, was to have short talks by people who were actually doing the research. Yes, I and it goes the, way back, I think, to, earlier to the to phage, phage group. Meetings, yes. Um, yes, and that's you what probably I, know that's more what about I thought, that than I do. That's what I thought the, the model was. I, I gave my first scientific talk at the phage meetings. It's well, I did as well. scary thing. Yeah. Um, but, but before that, there was the phage group that consisted of people like 
Watson and yeah. oh God, who who were they all? Luria and Orgel Delbrook, and Delbrook, and and they had these meetings where again it was very much a community. It was very much a family. Yeah. And I think Jim wanted to, when he became director of the Cold Spring Harbor Lab at the beginning, he wanted to continue that in all the different fields where meetings were being sponsored. Uh, and, you know, we certainly started out at Cold Spring Harbor for the first eight meetings or so, is that right? I can't remember the exact number. And just followed, followed the way they did things. I'm a young scientist. All of you have uh, started your adventures before I was born. That's why my question might sound a little weird to you. But I just wanted to ask, so have any of you, I mean the question is for all of you, have any of you experienced any bullying or workplace harassment in academia or do you think the academia has progressed sufficiently on those issues about accepting like minorities such as like racial or gender or do you think like we are doing our job enough in these issues? We're very hard on bullies. For what? So I think we've all seen cases of it in our environments. Um, hopefully it you know hasn't occurred in any of our labs without being swiftly dealt with. Um, I don't know, do other people have comments? Chris, do you have a comment? Mm. Oh, good. Oh. There you go. <laughs> don't bully, Harry, don't bully her. Just to illustrate it. No, I, uh, when I was a, uh, a let's see, I, I believe you, you had a little interaction with Howard Schachman at Berkeley. That, historical no, but, one, but, but, uh, but, but I, won't, <laughs> let, I won't pursue that, but I, I, I'll talk about mine. I, he was my undergraduate advisor, and uh, in my senior year, I went to him, and he pulled out my file, looked at my grades, and said, well, guess you're not going to graduate school. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just add a <clears throat> Howard Schachman comment. <laughs> When I um, <clears throat> was interviewing for jobs on the West Coast, uh, uh, I interviewed at Berkeley. And in my exit interview, and I was interviewing for a job which was not originally tenure track. It was something called the Virus Labs. And uh, I had my exit interview with Howard. And he said, well, you know, Christine, he said, I definitely want to convert this position into a tenure track position. It's good that you're a woman. It's too bad you're not black. <laughs> anyway, I, you know, it's a hard question to answer because I think we all know that, although in the past, uh, a lot of these issues, particularly about women, because there were no minorities to even talk about that were in the job market. Uh, there was lots of bullying, you know. I mean, we could all tell horrible stories. It's much less now because it's less overt. <laughs> you know, you can get arrested or <laughs> fired or, you know, whatever. But I think most people in the you know, world would agree that the, the hardest things in the end are going to be things that are not, you know, they're not obvious. And even the people who manifest these, you know, would be stunned to, to hear that they were still, uh, you know, uh, at some level biased. And I think that's not an issue about science. You know, I think it's a really general issue. So. Yeah, I think things have improved, but I think at a fundamental social level, there's still, for all of us, a long way to go. I, I just wanted to make a comment. Olki said at the very beginning, you know, he wanted us to think hard uh, tonight to make up for the, you know, time spent here. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, this was just an incredible uh, session 
because you know I think what makes science what it is is not just thinking, but it's the values, you know, it's the community, it's the history, it's understanding the history. And of course, I'm so much younger than you guys, <laughs> uh, so <laughs> so uh, so you know, I can I can say, um, you know, I, I I was just amazed, you know, that. Um, you know, Christine would, would sit there and, and, and share with us, you know, the depression she went through. I mean, where in today's society, in professional circumstances, you know, do you share your weaknesses? People don't do that, and I think that is, that is an awful deficiency. Um, you know, we are, we oftentimes, in many circumstances, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, you know, um, atmosphere of pretense, and I think what makes this, you know, you have been, you know, I've been sitting there like, you know, with your parents at the dinner table, you know, listening and picking up values, and I think, you know, for all of this community, myself included, having heard you speak about this, to me has been incredibly educational, and just to say one more thing, uh, you know, I, I guess a number of people don't think that I'm not, that think that I'm not lacking self-confidence. But when I came to these meetings here, you know, I knew nothing. Um, I, I'm a medical doctor by training. I was very aware of not knowing squat. Um, and, uh, you know, yet I had stumbled into an interesting story. And the way all of you talked to me, uh, you know, gave me feedback. You know, Ian once told me after a Banff meeting, this was the greatest shit talk I'd ever given. <laughs> Um, you know, in his very sympathetic side, it was so incredibly useful, believe it or not. This was, this was among a big group, I guess. <laughs> no, but basically what I wanted to say is, you know, this group is so genuine, and, and I think we can all only try to aspire uh, uh, to this and, and, and to maintain those uh, values. So, thank you very much. Hello? No. I, I'm uh, also a young scientist. <clears throat> and um, I just want to know, I mean, you all touched upon um, the good old days when funding was good and grants, grants were there. And I guess for somebody going into the field where funding doesn't look like it's too good, do you guys have any advice for, I mean, maybe it just takes more getting out there and showing your work. But um, yeah, I don't know. Any, any advice to somebody just kind of getting right into the field. <laughs> or maybe I should be asking my congressman, maybe this is more <laughs> government. Well, I think, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll bite the bullet here. I'm sure there's a range of opinions. And let me preface this by saying I'm by nature, I think, really optimistic. <laughs> Until the last depression, until 2008, every time things crashed at NIH, I could say with complete confidence to the people in my lab, things will get better. Hang in there. I still think that will happen, but the, the time delay has really been terrible. I do think there are some signs of things improving, like at and IGMS, the things they're trying to do are signs that maybe things will improve. People who are more senior, well above your pay grade at the moment, are maybe in this room, maybe can have some influence on the way those decisions get made. But, you know, my experience in the community is what I said, that the people who have really succeeded have been following their nose into interesting problems that they were really passionate and obsessed about. And so, you know, it's, I think that's what I would encourage people to try to do. I, I'm, I'm not very good at strategizing about careers. Other folks? So maybe this, is, this isn't a solution to anything, but I, would, I, I suspected and Marv actually even prepared us for questions of this sort. So I was, I was trying to, to think of all the people who have been through my lab as, as PhD students and as postdocs, just how many of them went on to independent PI 
positions and stayed in them. And, and that number is of the order, it's about 10% of the people. Um, and I have no idea what currently in the US the, the number would be um, across the field. But it, it you know, the, the good old days, to some extent, just never really existed because th th this is an area where, you know, we're, we're, we've had very, we and up here have had very good lives at the taxpayer's expense for a long time and there is a there's a limit to how many how what the size of the community can be um, and I, I completely agree with Marv that there is a really strong selection for people who just become obsessed about particular problems and have the creativity to, to solve them and that is is by no means everybody who enters the community so I I also think that from th these problems are to some extent international, the crash was international, but they're also to some extent national depending on how the system is set up and the system um, has been operating. And so there are countries in Europe which are doing much worse than the US and there are countries which are doing better. Um, many European PhD students went on to do postdocs, many postdocs went on to become faculty members in the US in, in, the, in past years. Um, there, are, there are horizons which people should be looking beyond uh, for the opportunities and there won't be an opportunity for everybody but I think it's worth looking more broadly for what opportunities exist inside and outside of, of basic research labs that can be interesting for you and just to follow your interests. I think that's... Melissa? So, um, I just wanted to continue on, go back to this theme of how can we keep the community that we have in the community of sharing uh, going and, and I was struck by what Joan said that it didn't actually start with you guys, it started before that and you've kept it going and the idea is to pay it forward and I've previously publicly thanked Joan and Christine and Brenda Bass um, for what they did for me when I was a postdoc. Um, but I wanted to actually tell a story about Ian, and he does, he may not remember this, but it He'll really... remember anything. And this is... Because uh, I think you were really drunk at the time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why I don't remember it, anything. It had a profound effect on me, but it, it, it illustrates exactly what I think we as a community need to keep doing. And that is when I uh, presented my poster at the, my first Cold Spring Harbor meeting, and it was about <coughs> ligate RNA together. And um, it was unpublished. And, um, you know, I, came, I also came from out, completely outside the field. And after that poster session, um, you came up to me after the bar and, and said, she, she, you said, I really want to tell you that what you did was really courageous because you're telling people this unpublished story and that's the way science should be, and I really respect you for that. And to have you say that to me when I was a postdoc, it made me feel like, I, it really empowered me, and that I really think that we should give young people um, the message to not be afraid, to just do things and, and tell people what you're doing. Um, and you know, make a community. Um, but that, that's the kind of thing that a senior member of the field can do for a young person that has a profound effect on them. And so thank you very much. Thank you.